Welcome back. So this is it. This is the last video in our series on uh, the origins and kind of the, the development of government. Um, today we're going to talk about what is civic virtue and then also why should government be limited. So we're going to talk about what your role is in government and then also why we should keep government limited so that it doesn't become too powerful. And if you think back to guys like Montesquieu um, and Rousseau, they're really arguing for a limited government that really makes sure that it protects the rights of people but also doesn't have too much power and too much control. So in your notes for today, you need to add this in as what is the importance of civic virtue and why should government be limited? And so when we talk about civic government, we're really talking about what is your role and what's your job in the government. And one of those is to do what is good for the common good. You might have heard that term before. I'm not really sure if you have or not, but if you haven't, that means government is supposed to do what is best for the community as a whole. So while we want government to look out for us, and we want them to look out after our individual rights and freedoms, it does have to also look out for what the, gover what the, the community as a whole needs. It can't only look out for one individual, it has to do what's best for everybody. And so when we think of the common good, then we think of, well, what is civic virtue? And that means putting the common good before your own interests. Believe me, I would love to have a monster truck to be able to drive down Highway 8, Interstate 80 out here and rack over cars and do whatever I wanted to and just have as much fun as possible, right? And while that's my interest and that's something I would like to do, that wouldn't be part of the co wouldn't be something for the common good, right? It would be destructful and, and, and dangerous to other drivers, right? It would it would make it to where uh, I am and being unsafe for myself and for the people around me, and so. For the common good, we have speed laws, right? We don't let people drive monster trucks down the road, right? We do these things, and as a result, part of my civic virtue is to give up some of those personal freedoms that I really might want to do because it's the right thing to do for society in general, for the common good. One individual we can talk about who really did something, who had a lot of civic virtue, um, was a guy by the name of Cincinnatus. Um, this is him pictured here. And you may or may not have talked about him when you were um, in sixth grade and talked about Roman history. But the idea of Cincinnatus is he's this glorious general who, who leads Rome into victory. And at the end of the war, he actually, instead of becoming an emperor and becoming a Caesar, he steps aside and lets somebody else be in power. And this was seen a very, as a very virtuous thing because while his own probably desire would be to be emperor, right? Instead, he used his civic virtue to do what was best for the common good, to make other people, give other people a chance and to have an, a, a difference of opinions and beliefs. In our own country, we have our own kind of Cincinnati, and his name is George Washington. After the Revolutionary War, George Washington had just won, and he rightfully could have been king if he had wanted to. He could have been a lifelong dictator had he wanted to. But when he's elected president of the United States, he serves for two terms, eight years total. And at the end of it, he says, I'm going to step away and I'm going to let somebody else lead. And that's pretty unheard of at this time. Most rulers took power and they were there until they died or they were violently overthrown. George Washington had a high civic virtue. He did what he thought what was, was best for the common good. He set what was known as a precedent. And it won't be until FDR in the 1930s and 40s that a president will actually serve for more than two terms. This was seen as such a momentous thing that people around the country celebrated it. In fact, the state of Ohio even named a city after George Washington. No, not Mount Vernon, the city where his home is, but they named a city called Cincinnati, named after George Washington in his momentous uh, uh, occasion of stepping down from power and being a modern day Cincinnati. One of the essential things about George Washington is that he knew government shouldn't have too much power. And as a result, we have to kind of ask ourselves, why and how is government limited? And so for the next part of your notes, you need to include this in because it's actually really important. It makes up kind of who we are as Americans and what our government is like, because we have this idea of kind of a limited government. The idea is that governments must be limited to prevent possible abuse of powers. Montesquieu talked about this a little bit. He said, no, no person should have too much power, right? move away from the ideas of an absolute monarch of a king or a dictator who has total control and split, split the government up into separate but equal parts. The United States will use that when we talk about checks and balances. And the idea is it limits people's ability to rule uncontrolled, right? They can't do anything they want, right? 
while we would all love for people to have high civic virtue like George Washington or myself, because I don't drive my monster truck up and down the interstate, right? We don't, we can't necessarily assume that people will. So as a result, Montesquieu would argue, break government up, make it into separate and equal parts, have those parts check over each other and make sure that one's not more important than the other. And then therefore, you know exactly what you're getting from each part and nobody becomes too powerful. If you remember back to our discussion on the Enlightenment, one of the things that the Enlightenment helped spurn is the American Revolution and then the American system of government. And there's no better example of this than the United States Constitution. It literally is a rule book for the United States. It tells our government exactly what it can and can't do. It sets up the type of government that we have, how it functions, how laws are made, and then what are the rights and responsibilities of citizens in the Bill of Rights. If you remember Baron de Montesquieu, he's the guy that really influences the Constitution. Just like Voltaire and his ideas of freedom of speech and religion are going to play an important part in the United States Bill of Rights. That basically says what your rights as a human being and a citizen of the United States are. In the United States, and in general, most governments, we have this idea of what is known as the rule of law. And that's the idea that laws are fair, they're enforced, and nobody is above the law, even the leader. For instance, President Obama cannot walk out into the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, just like President-elect Trump cannot do it either, right? That would be violating the law, and therefore he would be subject to the law, which means he could be found guilty of murder, right? No president, no dictator, no individual citizen is above the law. We must all follow it. That's the way that we keep government in line and we keep people from becoming too powerful, right? It's when we give people more power and we let them live above the law that then we run into problems. Montesquieu spoke of that separation of powers, and it's really important in the United States. We have three branches of governments whose job it is to check on each other and make sure everybody is equal and balanced out. The judiciary branch makes sure that all laws that are written by Congress and the legislature are fair. The executive branch makes sure that those laws are enacted and that they're actually done properly. And then the legislative branch, that third one, actually makes those laws and makes sure that everybody that there are, that there are laws that people are actually wanting. They listen to their constituents, the people who voted for them, and make sure that they're doing the things that those individuals want. Because if they don't, they run the risk of being removed from office by vote. All of this wraps up kind of nicely into something called the consent of the government. All right? And this is the idea that citizens give permission to be governed. Right? We vote for our leaders, and because we voted for them, then we are allowing them to be in charge. Right? Citizens can vote to change the government if they don't like it, or even a constitution. For instance, our constitution has been changed a number of times throughout history in what is known as an amendment, which means we literally change the constitution. We don't get a big giant black marker and kind of strike out the parts we don't like, or we don't take scissors and cut off the bottom parts and edit it the way we would, you know, maybe a research paper. Instead, what we do is we actually tack a new piece of the constitution to the bottom of it. And those amendments say how we would want to change things. And over the course of our history, we've changed it a number of times. We've given women the right to vote. We've given African Americans the right to vote and freed them from slavery after Civil War. We've gotten rid of alcohol and prohibition in the 18th Amendment and then oddly brought it back again in the 21st Amendment and allowed people to drink, consume alcohol and make it. We've done all sorts of things like lower the voting age and have direct election of senators and decided whether or not people, the government could collect taxes. And it's that way that we changed the, the government. If we don't like something, we petition our leaders. And if they don't do it, we vote them out of office. If they do do it, but it's not enough, we can change the Constitution. But amendments really should only be used in the most extreme circumstances. Now, one other important part of this is what is known as the rights of the minority. And that means that just because you are not one of the, one of the, the most powerful people in the country does not mean you don't have certain inalienable rights, as Jefferson would have said. The idea is it protects rights of smaller or unpopular groups, regardless of what the majority believes. So for instance, if the Democrats are in charge in Congress and in the White House, then that they hold a lot of power. But that does not mean the Republicans don't have any say. The Republicans have all sorts of measures, things like a filibuster, which means they can help they, they can use that to try to table any bill they don't like. At the same time, big states don't have all the power. Small states that are in the minority can band together and have certain things that they can do to make sure their voice is heard as well. So we tried, the founders tried really hard when they set up our government to make sure that one group wasn't more powerful than the other. That even in government, 
even the people, right, the different groups have almost a checks and balances system. They have ways to check the, the power of the majority. Hey, that's it. Those are the major things you need to make sure you remember. Remember, this all kind of starts to tie in pretty quickly to the Enlightenment. So if you had a pretty good grasp on the Enlightenment, then this really starts to make sense. But some of the things that are important are why is government limited? Well, we do it basically to protect minority rights, to protect our own individual rights, and to also make sure that the government is doing the things that it's supposed to. We, and, and also, one final thing, make sure we don't have one person who has too much power. We've really always tried to avoid in the United States a dictator, right? Finally, we also have, want to talk about the importance of civic virtue and why it's important to put the good of everybody above the needs of yourself, all right? If you have any questions, please send me an email. I hopefully will be back next week, so that way we can discuss this a little more. And we will also start talking about North Korea. And I'm going to give you an example of what happens when somebody rules completely and doesn't follow enlightenment ideas and doesn't believe in the ideas of civic virtue and common good, right? What happens when you have essentially a madman running their country? Uh, country? Until next time, uh, I will see you later. Have a great rest of your day and bye.